Hey class, in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at what tools and materials are needed for residential wiring, some different tools that are needed for residential wiring, and how you can get started wiring up your house. Our objectives are for you to identify tools, equipment, and the safe practices of residential or home wiring, and explain how electrical wall boxes are mounted to the wall. We've talked about mechanical systems. Remember, mechanical systems are electrical, plumbing, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. And they're installed after the building is framed or constructed. When working with electricity, it's important to remember that there are some safety considerations that you must consider. So what are some safety considerations that you have to think about when you're working with residential wiring and electricity? As Homer Simpson's showing us, electricity has the power to kill. So remember, electrical current can be extremely dangerous. So you wanna make sure that the power is off, that the circuit is off before you work on any type of electrical appliance or outlet. There are a number of ways to check to make sure that the power is off before you start working on an electrical device or a circuit. It's important to use the proper tools, especially tools with insulated handles. It's also important to remove all jewelry and other metal objects as metal can be a conductor. You wanna make sure that areas are dry and clean because water is a conductor. And you wanna make sure that if you work in an electrical environment that you have the proper tools and also equipment, which can also include clothing like rubber boots and rubber soled shoes. You also wanna make sure that you're only using wood or fiberglass ladders. And lastly, know your limitations. Know when you should call a professional. While there's a couple of things that I'll show you in class and a couple of things that I'm comfortable doing in my home when it comes to electricity, I know when I need to call a professional. Again, make sure the power is off before you're working on a wire. There's been a few times when I've been working on electrical uh, appliances in my house and I've zapped myself. I thought the power is off. I thought I hit the right circuit, but I didn't. So make sure you check to make sure the power is off before you get started. Be safe. There's a whole science to electricity and how electricity is generated. So in the next few slides, we'll just cover some of the basics of how electrical service comes to your house. In Wethersfield, most of our energy comes from the trash energy plant in the south end of Hartford. Maybe you've seen it on the side of the road on your way up to Hartford off the highway. Current is the flow of negatively charged electrons and is generated at a power station. In the diagram here, you can see the power station. At the power station, steam is generated, usually by burning uh, something or burning oil or burning natural gas. That burning then causes water to boil. That boiling water generates steam. The steam then turns a turbine, and as the turbine spins, it spins a generator, which generates electricity. The energy that comes to your house is called alternating current. Alternating current is generated at an electric power station and then travels through wires. Along the way, transformers step up or increase or step down and reduce the voltage that's required for different customers. The transformer makes the voltage either higher or lower. There are different types of transformers. One's called a substation, which might serve a whole town. The smaller transformers, which might serve a residence, are pole transformers. You might see those on your street. As a current travels through a variety of transformers, eventually it ends up coming to your house. After the last transformer, the voltage that enters your house is around 240 volts or 110 volts, depending on your home. As the electricity goes from the transformer to your house, it passes through a meter. You might see this meter on the outside of your house. This meter measures the amount of kilowatts per hour that your house uses. This is what is used to determine your electric bill monthly. The electrical service brings power from the transformer through the meter and then into the building. This main panel holds all the circuit breakers or fuses for each of your home's circuits. This panel should be installed by a trained certified electrician. This picture shows you the electrical service panel with the cover removed. You can see all the individual circuits, all the wires coming into the circuit, 
and then the wires going out to the different circuits around your house. Electrical circuits also have a grounding system for safety. Usually it's a copper rod driven about eight feet deep into the ground. Electricity leaves the main panels and then goes to small junction boxes in your house. These boxes enclose the wires that are used to control the electric current and control the electricity going to the device that is then plugged into the wall or used for a switch. As you can see, the boxes can be plastic or they can be metal. Inside the service box, you will most likely find circuit breakers that will trip if you have too many items plugged into a circuit. Older homes used to have fuses. However, I've been told that fuses are no longer allowed to be safely used in a house. These fuses are similar to the fuses that you'd see in a car. They would break, you'd unscrew them like a light bulb, and screw them back in. Again, circuit breakers are used to shut off power to the circuit in case of a fault in the circuit or if there's too much current being drawn. If that doesn't happen, the wire can heat up and fail and even cause a fire. There are some certain and specific tools that are used when we're doing some electrical wiring. Those include making sure you have the right number of switches, the receptacle or the outlets, making sure you have wire nuts that fasten wires together, make sure you have the right number and type of junction boxes, either metal or plastic, make sure you have the right type of wire. In this case in class, we're gonna be using 14-2 non-metallic wire, which I'll explain in a little bit. We wanna make sure that we have staples, which will hold the wire to the two by fours. We also wanna make sure we have a good quality pair of wire strippers, like you see on the slide. Another useful tool are some linesman pliers. It's also good to have a circuit tester to make sure the circuit is wired correctly before you turn the power on, and also to make sure that the wire has been disconnected from the power before you start tugging at the wires. And also, you wanna make sure you have a good quality screwdriver. Next, we're gonna take a look at wires. Wires are conductors. Conductors carry current, and the wires that we're gonna take a look at are enclosed in either conduit, a metal sheath, or a plastic sheath. And the wire that we use is 14-2 non-metallic cable that is wrapped in a plastic sheath. The wire runs from the main panel to the junction boxes throughout the house. So what do I mean by 14-2 wire? So 14 stands for the gauge or the thickness of the wire. The gauge of wire can determine the amount of electric current that the wire can safely carry, as well as the wire's electrical resistance and weight. Generally speaking, the smaller the gauge number, the thicker the wire. So 14-2 means that there are two 14 gauge wires in the cable, including a ground wire. So even though there's three wires, we still call it 14-2. If you had 14-3 cable, you would see uh, four wires, three wires covered in plastic sheathing, and one ground coming out of the cable. To make this easy to identify, a lot of times they will identify with writing on the cable what type of cable it is, and they are also now starting to color code the sheathing to make it easy to identify what type of wire and gauge you are using to help make our jobs a little bit easier. This non-metallic wire is very common uh, for indoor wiring. And 14-2 is made up of a hot wire, a ground wire, and a neutral wire. As you can see, one of the wire has a white insulation, and one of the wires has a black insulation, and one of the wires, the ground, has no insulation. We're going to discuss that next. As we said, electricity is the movement of negatively charged electrons through a conductor. In this case, the conductor is the hot wire. So the black wire is the wire that carries the current throughout the system. So it's important to know when you're wiring that the black wire is the hot wire. Next is what's called the neutral wire, or the white wire. That acts as a return for the current to go back to the circuit panel to complete the circuit. So again, electricity flows from the hot to the device and then back 
through the neutral wire. When you put a device in between the hot and neutral, in this case, maybe a light bulb, when you add electricity, that will cause the light bulb to light. Modern electric wiring also requires a ground. A ground is a wire that allows any stray current to literally go to the stake in the ground that's outside of your house. That's why it's called a grounding wire. The grounding wire is required for safety. So once again, hot wire, black, neutral wire, white, and the grounding wire is copper. When we start to wire up outlets and light switches, it's important to remember which one goes where. So remember which one is hot, which one is neutral, and which one is the ground. After the house is framed, electricians will go through the house and actually mark on studs where the junction boxes should go. And these are examples of different junction boxes that you would see. The wire leaves the electric main and then will go into these junction boxes throughout the house. When you walk down the electrical aisle of Lowe's and Home Depot, you will notice that there are what are called new work boxes and then there are what are called old work boxes. What's the difference? Well, a new work box is a box that is used for new work, new construction. This box can be mounted on the side of a two by four and then driven into the stud using nails. The new work box should also stick out from the two by four the correct distance for the width of drywall that will be installed on the wall. So it's good to know that. There are also tabs on the back that can be broken off for the electrical wire to actually come in to the junction box. So that's a new work box. The other type of boxes are what are called old work boxes. So what if you have a house that already has a wall up and you want to put in a new junction box? That's where you're going to go ahead and put in an old work box. When I was renovating my bathroom upstairs, I used some old work boxes. What I did is I cut out the right size hole in my drywall. I went ahead and put in one of these old work boxes. I drove the screw in here with a drill, this little tab lifted up and locked in place, holding this junction box into my wall. Now, before I put it in the wall, I had to make sure to pop this little tab and get the wire into the junction box so I could do the wiring that I need. The other thing I did is I fastened this onto the wall with some screws. So again, you will see new work boxes and old work boxes, so make sure you get the right box for the job. And lastly, these boxes come in different sizes, so make sure you get the right size for the job you're trying to do. Now in class, using our 2x4 framed, we would be installing some new work boxes. You would mark on the stud where you want the junction box to go. Using your new work box, you're going to drive some nails to hold the junction box in place, making sure that you leave the right distance for the drywall that we're going to be installing. After the junction boxes are installed, you're going to start running your cable. As you run cable, it's important to make sure that the staple is at least six inches away from the box. After that, you want to make sure you drive a staple in every four feet of wire. You also want to make sure that you have at least six inches of wire sticking out of the junction box to make sure you have enough wire to work with. In residential construction, after the wiring is done, before the drywall is installed, a home inspector will come and inspect the house to make sure that the electrical wiring has been done correctly. As with many other trades, electrical wiring is regulated by the codes and regulations of the electrical trade. So the home inspector will make sure the electrical wiring is done correctly based on those laws and codes. If he sees any types of errors, you will have to fix those, which might delay the construction and final construction date of your project. Having straight wires that run straight and true and a neatly done and completed junction box are things that will make the inspector know that you care about your job and that you're doing your job correctly. So today we just covered some of the basics of tools, equipment, and safe practices of home wiring. There's a lot more to learn. This was just a brief overview. We also talked about electrical wire and some junction boxes that are used when you're mounting junction boxes to the wall 
and in starting off doing home wiring. We'll be covering a lot more content in the next videos. Thanks for watching.